offer. Now I'm just going to go through a little bit about breast ultrasound and then wrap up with some suggestions. Patient positioning is, is critical. As you'll see in the next slide, we typically position a patient like we do a normal breast examination. There are various ultrasound reasons on why we do that, but the ipsilateral arm above the head is a good example. We uh, absolutely need a coupling gel that's liberally applied and warm. Uh, we use a gentle pressure with the ultrasound transducer to make sure we have the connection, and we can increase that pressure if we <coughs> excuse me, need greater uh, penetration. I apologize for these older black and white pictures. They're just showing here a radial scan uh, of the breast. Here's another uh, image uh, angling underneath the uh, nipple areolar complex. There's a whole bunch of terminology that goes with doing ultrasound, whether it's abdominal, thyroid, breast, or whatever. We talk about scanning in different planes. So one plane is a transverse plane. Uh, another uh, plane uh, is a um, uh, sagittal or longitudinal sort of uh, plane. And I'm not sure whether this pointer is, it looks like the battery is, is down. Oh, there it goes, okay. Uh, uh, in a plane. Then we typically orient the images based on the face of the clock in the breast, distance from the nipple areolar complex. And then in addition to transverse and sagittal scanning, we typically do what's called radial scanning, which is in the radial axis of the hands of a clock, or anti-radial scanning, which is uh, uh, perpendicular to that. In other words, we need to image always in two planes. Just a little bit of anatomy. Uh, these don't project very well because of the light, but the skin has certain ultrasound characteristics and thickness. Uh, it was, you know, the uh, moderator was kind to talk about the book we did one of the things we did in this book was to put line drawings uh, underneath our images so that the image then would not be cluttered with arrows and lines going to it. And the concept of the book and many of our ultrasound images was, was that your eyes would literally move back and forth. So here's an example then of the Cooper's ligaments. So to orient you, the transducer is here, skin is here, subcutaneous fat. Cooper's ligaments are rising here from the anterior mammary fascia. We then have to teach the language of ultrasound when we talk about things being bright, which is hyperechoic, things being darker, which is hypoechoic, isoechoic, et cetera. And so the glandular part of the breast uh, here is uh, hyperechoic, as are the Cooper's ligaments. We have a variety of other terms that we teach as well. Just another image down through here. The battery is running low, by the way, Ben, in this pointer. Uh, down to the pectoralis muscle, full view of the breast here with the glandular tissue, retromammary fat, et cetera. Again, these are the kinds of things that we teach in a course. Image then, uh, and as a radial scan, as an image of the, uh, maybe I can do it with a touch pad. Uh, image then of the ductal um, system a radial view so that if you did have a uh, 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 lesion within the ductal system, you may absolutely be absolutely able to see it or not. Examples of the kinds of things that we may then end up imaging, here's a good example uh, of a um, complex cyst. And then we learn how to describe it. It's not completely anechoic. Anechoic means black. So that things, when they are black, mean they have no internal echoes in them. Here you can see a bunch of material as internal echoes. This goes along with a typical sort of complex cyst. The margins are reasonably well circumscribed. It's thinly encapsulated. There is enhanced posterior and, uh, transmission or posterior enhancement. Again, part of the lingo. Here's a palpable mass that is round and sort of oval in shape. Uh, reasonably smoothly uh, marginated and defined. Internal echoes are relatively homogeneous, again, using the terminology here. And while we cannot absolutely say that this is a benign lesion, a core biopsy showed this was a very typical fibroadenoma. On the other hand, comparing two different views of a cancer that's taller than it is wide, the internal echoes are heterogeneous, Interestingly, there is some posterior enhancement, et cetera, 
Again, we're not trying to make a definitive diagnosis. The definitive diagnosis in a case like this is made either with an ultrasound guided FNA or core biopsy. Interventional use then of, uh, as I've alluded to, of ultrasound. Here's an example of using just a vacutainer hooked up as a way of aspirating a simple cyst. Ultrasound can also be used to aspirate seromas as an example. Here's an example of doing large core biopsies. Now this particular device could be a little pricey even though the needles are disposable, but in the lower resource parts of the world, I think clearly there are more spring activated devices that can be used in performing uh, these uh, biopsies instead of, as one of the speakers said this morning, having to do an excisional biopsy. Interoperatively, examples of interoperative use are visualizing localization wires. I'll show you an example of a lumpectomy and looking at the specimen, helping to guide sentinel node procedures, and where you do partial breast radiation therapy, actually using ultrasound to place those devices. The large core biopsy, to me, is one of the simplest things that can be done in a lower resource uh, environment with relatively inexpensive uh, tools and to me should be part of the front line almost around the world in making a diagnosis of breast cancer. In courses that we do, we teach different ways of making sure that the needle is underneath the ultrasound beam. The ultrasound beam, frankly, is only about as wide as your business card. So we teach that we don't want to necessarily angle the needle like you show, as shown here, because we may not be able to see the needle well, but in fact, we want to bring the needle in parallel to the ultrasound beam so that we can see it and that it's in plane and hitting the, uh, the target that we're after. Ultrasound guided lumpectomy, here's just an example on, on the left of a, while I grant you this was a palpable cancer that was undergoing a lumpectomy or partial mastectomy, Here's that same lesion now in saline as a way then of evaluating the margins in using ultrasound within the OR. Well, this is my uh, last slide, and I'm doing all this in 15 minutes, so we're catching up on, on schedule. The performance of breast ultrasound in low-income settings should continue to be, because I guess it is a goal, of the Breast Health Global Initiative. You've got this in your guidelines now. I'm here to advocate for more of this worldwide. The diagnosis of breast cancer by ultrasound guided biopsies in the low income setting should also continue to be a goal of, of our, our group. The training of physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers in breast ultrasound should continue. And one of the reasons Ben got me here is to start talking, I guess we're gonna talk about this this afternoon, more about training worldwide. I believe there are companies that will help support this effort and not only the world of ultrasound and the companies that make ultrasound equipment, I believe there will be support of the manufacturers of companies who do needle biopsy uh, devices from spring activated to freehand to up to vacuum assisted uh, who will help us uh, in this effort and I do believe that we can have the cooperation of qualified organizations uh, like the American Society of Breast Surgeons who are privileged at this meeting to have not only myself but two other former uh, past presidents of our society. And one of the very strong stated goals of Breast Surgery International is to become more involved uh, in ultrasound training worldwide. Polly, where are you? Polly, Polly Chung from Hong Kong is here someplace, I saw her. And she is following me as president of Breast Surgery International, and that's going to be one of the major efforts of our group internationally. Thank you for your attention.